Uh, that, uh, that was a very, very good panel. I hope we uh, can do as, as good a job eliminating some of the economic challenges in the relationship, uh, which are, uh, are many. Let me start uh, with an introduction. Uh, first, uh, on my side, uh, first to my left here, is uh, the Honorable Ibrahim al-Assaf, who is obviously well known as Saudi Arabia's Minister of Finance. He's been the minister since 1996. Uh, Prince Turkey said last night at the dinner that to the extent Saudi Arabia uh, now has the strongest reserves in its history, much of the credit belongs to him. Uh, he is also on the board of directors of Saudi Aramco, chairman of the Fund for Saudi Development, and also chairman of the uh, Public Investment Fund, uh, one of the Saudi uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds. So next to him is, uh, and then is Heidi uh, Kribo Redeker, who since early 2009 has overseen, excuse me, the um, International Economic and Financial Issues section for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, she was the founding co-director of the Global Strategic Financial Initiative in uh, 2008 at the New America Foundation after returning from about 16 years in Europe as an investment banker. Now next to Heidi, we have Brad Borland, who is considered the dean of uh, economic analysts in Saudi Arabia. Since 2007, he has been the head of research and the chief economist of Jadwa Investments. Prior to that, he spent many years as the chief economist of the Samba Financial Group. Uh, he is uh, widely read for his deep and very balanced uh, approach to the economy in the region and his knowledge of, of markets and global economy. And next, uh, next in line on our panel is the uh, Honorable uh, Muhammad al Jasser, who was recently named the new governor of the Saudi Arabian Central Bank. In fact, so recently that he still sometimes, as last night, introduces himself as the vice governor. <coughs> uh, he began his career with the Ministry of Finance in 1981, then later joined the IMF uh, and eventually uh, became the executive director of the IMF, a post he held until 1995. Uh, that was the year he was appointed the governor of the, uh, the vice governor, excuse me, of the Central Bank. A uh, post from which he also played a key role in negotiating Saudi Arabia's entry into the WTO. And then last, we've got uh, Flint Leverett, who is currently the senior fellow and director of the New America Foundation's uh, Geopolitics of Energy Initiative. He also teaches at Pennsylvania State University in a new school of international affairs. He worked on Middle Eastern issues uh, for the U.S. government for 11 years as a senior analyst at the CIA a member of the Secretary of State's policy planning staff, uh, and as a senior director of Middle Eastern Affairs for the National Security Council. Uh, he left the National Security Council in March of 2003, just before the Iraq invasion, a date that he points out is not, the timing was not coincidental. So that's our panelists for this, the next couple hours. Um, what I'd like to do is start with a question and, and address sort of broadly Saudi Arabia's role in the global economy. One of the headlines that uh, came out of the ministerial meetings this weekend, one of the papers that we've seen quite a bit for the last couple of months, is, is the idea that the global crisis has brought an end to the old world order, particularly the old world economic order. And for the past several decades, I think Saudi Arabia and the U.S., the economic relationship has been one, one of the mainstays of that order, but has largely been defined in terms of the role Saudi Arabia plays in the oil markets. But now with the emergence of the G20, Saudi Arabia is being called upon to play a much larger role in stabilizing and managing the world economy. And it's in a unique position to do that as part of the G20. It's one of the few countries with a strong surplus, uh, and I believe it's also the only Arab and the only OPEC member in the G20. So what I'd first like to start with is to ask each of you to kind of address how you see that ro the role evolving for Saudi Arabia from the perspective of the governor and the minister. I'm interested in how you see what role you would like to take on, what can you productively take on, what new responsibilities are you willing to take on? And from the perspective of the other panelists, uh, a bit more from the perspective of the U.S. or the broader world, what roles would you like to see Saudi Arabia play? How would you like to use its growing influence? Mr. Well, uh, Saudi Arabia has been playing a very active and important role in the, the world economy, but particularly it has an extremely important systemic role in the, in the oil market. Uh, and uh, being uh, a member of the, the G20 is not an accident uh, because of the history of uh, Saudi Arabia and the world economy, because of the history of Saudi Arabia in helping the international financial institutions, particularly the IMF, 
and the World Bank, uh, and the World Bank, but also our uh, big role in, in ODA, Official Development Assistance mm -hmm. to Developing Countries. We we are among the highest uh, when it comes to to uh, our assistance to developing countries uh, compared to our GDP. Uh, our our assistance is uh, over one one uh, percent of our GDP. As we all know, <coughs> uh, all developing developed countries, except maybe a few of the Northern Europe, uh, mm -hmm. that even uh, that they have less than. Uh, 0.5 or 0.3 percent of the GDP dedicated to to foreign aid. Uh, so, so all these roles, and, and in addition to the prudent and very responsible uh, management of our mm -hmm. our um, uh, financial resources, uh, made it, of course, easier for when when the the G20 was was uh, constructed. Mm -hmm. to to uh, to have Saudi Arabia as an active member in that in that group uh, the the uh, as you know Saudi Arabia has also been having a separate seat at the the World Bank and mm -hmm. the IMF and, and and again that that helped but uh, all these elements uh, together uh, Led to, to to the inclusion of, of uh, Saudi Arabia and the and the uh, G20, but I must say and stress once again that our responsible and very uh, 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 balanced oil policy mm -hmm. that takes into account the the consuming countries and the the uh, the uh, producing countries um, has been has been. Uh, something that, that should be uh, and have been uh, recognized. I must say that, that uh, on this note, uh, forgive me for taking a little bit more than uh, I should. We are, uh, when you look around, Saudi Arabia is perhaps the only country in the world that's now uh, investing in, 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 in uh, uh, more capacity, more refining capacity, and I'm sure that this investment will come in handy when the world economy starts recovering, that mm -hmm. we will be ready to provide the world with the, with the uh, needed supply uh, of oil. Because no other country, except very few places, where, where investment is being taken place uh, right now. OK. Thank you very much. I've actually also just uh, I did a little bit of a, I didn't realize that you had all been asked first to prepare. Uh, uh, for 10 minutes of prepared comments, which unfortunately I didn't know. So I'm going to, I'm going to cut now. Choose from, you can you can choose answer my question or make your own prepared comments. Thank you very much, Heidi. Um, do you, you want me to answer the the? Uh, you can you can do whichever you like at this point. I have like a prepared to... statement too. Okay. I worked very hard on it. So. <laughs> why, don't, why don't I suggest that, that you give why your prepared I... statements? <laughs> well, my apologies. I'm sorry I didn't know that. Why don't you give me your prepared statement first? We'll do the prepared statements, and then we'll come back to the question. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. Do you all want to come up here then? <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> that was a nice warm-up for, for my <laughs> visit. Steve <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's uh, indeed pleasure and privilege for me to address this uh, distinguished gathering on the subject whose importance to our two countries uh, is self-evident. <clears throat> self Let me start by, by uh, thanking the, the Committee on Foreign Trade and the New America Foundation for organ organizing this, this uh, conference. And uh, I must uh, pay special thanks to Steve Clemens and, um, and uh, our team from the CIT, uh, particularly Dr. Abdelaziz Al Fahad and mm -hmm. Khaled Al Saif and Omar uh, Bahlewa, as well as uh, our, the, the uh, newly discovered godfather of the, the CIT, uh, my good friend Abdullah Ali Rida Zainal. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United States have enjoyed a long-standing, deep-rooted, and broad-based uh, relationship that dates back uh, to the early 1930s. 
trading and investment partnership has since uh, flourished in, the, uh, in, in, in line with the Saudi Arabia's transformation into a bustling, diversified economy. U.S. firms remain the largest uh, investors in Saudi Arabia, and at the same time, the U.S. is a prime destination for, for Saudi investors. Trade between our two nations uh, has also thrived, and the U.S. has remained Saudi Arabia's largest trading partner for almost half a century, as my colleague Abdullah Zainal mentioned earlier. Moreover, the U.S. has regained uh, the status as the major higher education destination for Saudi, Saudi students, and our latest data uh, shows that we have about 26,000, not 20,000 uh, students uh, studying in the uh, government-sponsored students studying in the United States. This is about 50% of all Saudi students uh, that are sponsored uh, studying abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I, I share my thoughts on expanding cooperation between Saudi Arabia and the United States going forward, I would like to say a few words about the, the ongoing global crisis, uh, which is no doubt a very important uh, element and a high priority of the U.S. international U.S.-Saudi international cooperation at this time. This is undoubtedly uh, an unprecedented crisis of enormous global consequences. It originated here, it quickly spread to Europe, and before we knew it, it engulfed the, the whole world. What we now face is not just a loss of confidence in financial markets, but a real global deep recession, with many, uh, many countries having to deal with the huge declines and the values of, of financial and real assets, business uh, shutdowns and bankruptcies, jobs losses, and in some cases, social arrest. Saudi Arabia is, is doing all it can to play uh, its part in the international efforts to resolve this, uh, this crisis. Fortunately, prudent policies, uh, conservative investment strategies, and effective Regulations have uh, placed Saudi Arabia in a better uh, position to deal with the crisis at home than many other countries. We also have point, uh, joined, uh, joined the global effort to address the, the causes and consequences of the crisis. We have strongly supported the, the joint G20 um, actions that began, uh, began with the November 2008 summit here in Washington. And according to the IMF, the size of the Saudi financial stimulus is, um, uh, as, as proportion to uh, our GDP, is the highest among the G20 uh, uh, countries. It, it was 2.4% uh, in 2008, 3.3% this year, and expected to be 3.5% uh, next year. For, the, for this year, we have announced the largest budget in our history, approaching about $130 billion, uh, with 36% increase in investment in order to spare domestic dem uh, demand and increase productive capacity. We have um, also uh, strengthened uh, the capital, uh, the, the, uh, we have also strengthened the, the, the capital of important national institutions to enable them to expand financing, especially for large projects, small and medium uh, enterprises, and home, home ownership. Let me add here that the Saudi fiscal stimulus package, uh, which is largely targeted to build infrastructure, open, opens up enormous business opportunities for American equipment uh, suppliers, engineering firms, and contractors. And in the same vein, I look forward to opportunities for Saudi Arabia's businesses under the United States stimulus uh, package. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I'm sure you are well aware of the, that Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, maintained policies of economic freedom and openness with minimal government uh, intervention. We have an economy that is the largest and attract the, the most investments in the Middle East. And Saudi Arabia is also blessed with the vast natural resources other than oil. We are also fortunate to have a large and growing educated youth ready to assume its place in growing economy. We have been undertaking uh, 
uh, structural reforms to diversify our economy and uh, reduce its dependence on oil. And if you don't believe me, listen to the news tomorrow where King Abdullah will be visiting Jubail and he will be inaugurating a number of uh, uh, projects that worth more than $20 billion. This, is, this comes in the heels of uh, another inauguration a couple of years ago uh, of, of uh, a, a, uh, a big number of projects in, in Jubail related mainly to the petrochemical but also other industries. We have um, uh, policies, uh, laws, and regulations in place that are among the most business uh, friendly in the world. And indeed, the World Bank Group uh, doing business report now ranks Saudi Arabia as number 16 among 181 countries rated in business friendly environment. But what we want and are taking actions for is to be among the top 10 countries in terms of uh, business friendliness. In short, I can say that Saudi Arabia offers uh, offer a very hospitable trade and investment environment for American businesses, business community, and other international business <coughs> uh, communities. The other part of the equation is the environment in the United States for business for Saudi non-oil exports and uh, investment. And uh, while activities in these areas are market driven, I believe there is uh, a scope for increasing awareness, re removing barriers, and improving incentives, and remove the fear factor. An important link is the, the signing of uh, an agreement on the avoidance of double taxation. This agreement is a must if we to further promote investment between our two countries. <clears throat> and I must appreciate the, the great work that the U.S. Saudi Saudi Arabian Business Council is doing to promote awareness and uh, of and familiarize the business communities and the two countries with uh, bilateral trade and investment opportunities. The council has been organizing visits from different U.S. states to the kingdom to promote trade and investment, and I was pleased to to receive a few days ago a delegation from the state of Minnesota. Uh, headed by the Honorable Member of the U.S. Congress, Keith uh, Allison. We need to build on this work. Additional efforts are also needed to, uh, in, uh, in both the U.S. and Saudi Arabia to improve understanding of our respective cultures. We also need uh, to, to, make, uh, to make it easier for our business uh, students, businessmen, students, the, uh, teachers, tourists, and um, others to travel to each other's country. While good progress has been made in improving the procedures uh, to the U.S. for for uh, U.S. Cit for Saudi citizens, I, I am personally aware of many occasions when Saudi nationals have been unable to undertake uh, uh, timely travel to the United States due to lengthy uh, visa procedures. I believe further efforts are needed to strengthen this process and smoothen it uh, as well. On a related matter, it is, uh, it is essential to strengthen the, the efforts to promote the trade and investment, uh, rising protectionist uh, tendencies in various quarters of the world must be resisted. Here I welcome the uh, commitment by our leaders at the G20 summit to, to refrain from protectionism. And as you know, uh, financial protectionism in particular attracted the attention of the leaders at the recent London summit. According to the World Bank, Saudi Arabia is one of uh, the only, only three G20 members that have uh, implemented the standstill uh, commitment of the G20 Washington summit and refrain from any protectionist uh, policies. Let me now uh, briefly share a few thoughts about the U.S.-Saudi international cooperation. I will focus on three aspects. The first is the joint uh, U.S.-Saudi investment in third countries, uh, particularly developing countries in the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood of Saudi Arabia. I see many possibilities of, uh, of uh, such investments in food and energy sectors. And in my view, the uh, potential is large and possibilities are many. <clears throat> the the uh, 
the key question is to, to bring the potential partners together, and it may, may be useful to set up an informal working group as a first uh, step. The second aspect is for our two countries to, um, uh, to find common ground and uh, further cooperating in multilateral development uh, and financial institutions, particularly the Bretton Woods uh, institutions and uh, the regional development banks, where both countries are members. Among other things, such cooperation would need to recognize the, the systemic importance of Saudi Arabia in the world economy and the oil market in particular, which I mentioned earlier. I should say that the, uh, over the years there has been some cooperation in a number of issues with our colleagues at the US Treasury, particularly during uh, this crisis. Finally, we, we can work together to find a win-win formula to fulfill our respective obligations under the new climate regime being negotiated under the UNFCCC platform. Although this is essentially a, a political process, uh, it is its outcome, whatever this outcome is, would highlight uh, the need for the US-Saudi cooperation. We, we should strengthen cooperation between our two countries to promote production and use of cleaner fossil fuels as they will remain the, uh, the predominant energy uh, base for the world in the foreseeable future, as mentioned uh, earlier in this panel. Before concluding, ladies and gentlemen, I would uh, like you to think about the, the potential of further and more active approach to our economic relationship. We all know the, the opportunities that the U.S. economy offers, even during the current crisis. But not many, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, know about all the opportunities that our economy offers now, but more importantly, in the near future. We will eventually come out of this crisis. Then no, doubt, no other country in the world is well placed to satisfy <laughs> the increasing world demand for oil and petrochemicals and related products except Saudi Arabia. I mentioned that a little bit earlier as well. Private sector should be ready for even more impressive economic boom that our country will witness soon. Clearly, I am very upbeat about our economic prospects. And on this positive note, I conclude my remarks and thank you and thank the, 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 the organizers <clears throat> uh, for providing a platform uh, for what I am sure will prove to be most productive uh, exchange of views. Thank you very much. Now, Heidi, if you want to come up, I'm not introduce everyone again, however. Good morning. Um, I'd like to thank, first of all, the organizers of this important event, um, Steve Clemens uh, in particular in the New America Foundation where I used to work, not only for the opportunity to address you today, but also more importantly for having the foresight to grasp before most others the centrality of the role of economic and financial issues as they relate to national security and to foreign policy. I'd also like to emphasize that I'm speaking um, this morning in my individual capacity and not, um, not in the capacity of, of uh, said the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. So let me take a few minutes to frame the issue from the U.S. perspective and to speak a bit about how the economic issues in the financial crisis are affecting the world's broader foreign policy landscape. First, I'm going to talk a little about uh, the, a few ways the, um, the external landscape is changing. Next, how the U.S. itself is positioning um, itself in that changing foreign landscape. And finally, some ideas about the most constructive way to address this challenge um, in the coming months. A basic assumption, um, green shoots aside, is that we don't yet know where this economic crisis will end. I also think that the crisis is going to be a driving geopolitical force for a long time. A month ago, the Director of National Intelligence opened his annual threat assessment to Congress with the, the amazing statement, um, and I quote, the primary near-term security concern of the US 
is the global economic crisis and its geopolitical implications. I say amazing because the US is engaged in two wars, facing the threat of a nuclear Iran and tackling terrorism, amongst other things. So first, we'll look at a few ways the external landscape might change in the, um, in the context of this crisis. We may see some governments acting from an increasing position of strength and using levers that we in the US have not in recent times contemplated. And an example of this is, is China and its large holdings of US assets and its desire to protect those assets and the value of, other, of those assets by putting the US dollar reserve currency question on the table. A rational step from the Chinese perspective that the US needs to better understand. Also, as a result of this crisis, it's quite possible we may see friends and allies less able to meet their defense and their humanitarian commitments. We may also see bad actors looking to make mischief in times of turmoil, while no names will be named here. The US and her allies need to pay attention to countries heading towards an economic cliff, where associated domestic political instability can lead sometimes to abrupt political change especially when that change could have a regional impact. And we've already seen governments in, in Eastern Europe fall. We've seen them fall in the Baltics and Iceland. We've witnessed riots in Western Europe and Southeast Asia. One of these examples last fall really gave a wake-up call to Washington. When Iceland, a NATO member, found itself facing a financial collapse, when its pleas for immediate help went unanswered by its traditional allies, it went public with a last ditch approach to Russia for a 4 billion euro loan. While the Russia deal was never consummated, Iceland's prime minister's words at the time were chilling. We have not, and I quote, we have not received the kind of support that we were re requesting from our friends. So in a, si a situation like that, one has to look for new friends. The next question is how the US itself is positioned in the changing foreign landscape and what are both the challenges and the opportunities? How much of a toll has the crisis taken on the ability of the US to influence the external landscape? What happens when the loss of unquestioned financial hegemony and unquestioned um, ideological leadership in the world takes place? This crisis has opened up the debate for several, several fundamental questions that many, especially in the US, had until recently thought were settled and no longer open for discussion. How the US responds to these questions will likely determine the extent of continued US global, global leadership for years to come. Luckily, at the most recent G20 Leaders Summit, of which Saudi Arabia is an important member, I think that President Obama and his team demonstrated a high degree of awareness of the depth of the challenges that these economic issues posed to the US in the foreign policy arena. Now, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the US enjoyed a sole superpower dominance, not just in military terms, but also in financial power, in centrality to the world's capital flows, and in the dominant financial role provided um, by preaching the so-called uh, Washington Consensus. This dominant financial role provided enormous political and strategic benefits to the United States. But even before the economic crisis took hold, the financial world was already becoming increasingly multipolar. Financial centers in London, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Singapore, and Dubai, increasing central bank reserves in Asia and the Gulf, and increasingly attractive investment opportunities around the globe, allowed capital to flow both into, out of, and through markets around the world. The rapid development of financial centers around the world and the increasing wealth transfer from richer nations to developing ones meant that the US no longer had the only set of keys to the world's financial markets. The world of finance had already become multipolar. Then came the financial crisis, and with it a very real and serious threat to the economic and by extension political challenge and status quo. So much so that at the conclusion of this month's London summit, British Prime Minister Gordon Brown himself said, the Washington consensus is over. Today's economic crisis, alleged by many to have at least some of its roots in the so-called Anglo-American model of capitalism, has opened up new discussions. What model might best be followed by governments seeking to advance the development and growth of their own countries in this difficult economic environment? 
at what pace should it be implemented, and what is the political system that best suits a balance between economic security and growth and political stability? And where does the state fit into capital and capitalism? Who would have guessed that a mere 18 months after the frenzy over the threats posed by sovereign, um, uh, sovereign wealth funds owned by the state, that the US would find itself owning large positions in its own banks and insurance companies? These questions present both a challenge and an opportunity for the US to ensure the conclusion that others draw is one that's consistent with their and our national interests and security. As finding the best way to address foreign policy challenges um, growing out of an economic crisis, I go back to the incident of Iceland to draw some lessons. The first is to make sure that the multilateral institutions that we have in place, like the IMF, mm, <coughs> and the World Bank have sufficient legitimacy and financial capability to support the next Iceland and the Iceland after that, to see this crisis through to the end. IMF loans come with strings attached, but they are mainly the strings of the financial type rather than the strategic. The second lesson has to do with remembering who your friends are and not taking them for granted so that there are no situations in this time of economic turmoil where one has to look for new friends. While the US is now the world's largest debtor and Saudi Arabia is among the world's most cash-rich nations, it is important for all of us to remember who each other's friends are and to maintain those friendships. One of the most positive changes this crisis, brought, uh, crisis has brought is the elevation of the G20 group format. And this is, this is also addressing your question earlier. Um, it's, it's, it is a, it's a huge departure from the way that, um, that countries met in the, in the past to discuss these issues. And as the prime format for discussing these issues moving forward, it has a much greater set of legitimacy. It's imperative that we continue the process begun earlier this month at the London Summit, and we work together collectively to use whatever means we have at our disposal to ensure that we minimize the impact of the global economic crisis and ensure that it doesn't develop into a political crisis and work towards a foreign policy goal that is common um, and with common national security goals as well. Thank you very much. Next up, Brad Borland. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. <clears throat> I live and work and gain my livelihood in Saudi Arabia, and uh, so I thought I would address this this morning by answering several questions that come to me in relation to the financial crisis, global recession, and how it affects Saudi Arabia. And I'll throw in Jane's question at the end as well. But those questions are, first, what's the impact of the slump in oil prices over the past year? Second, is our, and by our I mean Saudi Arabia's, is our economic boom over? Third, what are our financial conditions like? And fourth, what's happened in our markets and uh, what's happened to our investors? And then fifth, I'll turn back to Jane's question and take a look at where I think Saudi Arabia's economy stands, particularly in relation to the United States, when we get to the other side of the valley, when we move beyond the recession and things go back to normal. So first, the implications of the slump in oil prices. As you know, oil prices have lost $100 a barrel in the past year and Saudi Arabia is producing about a million barrels per day less than it was producing last year, and that adds, adds up to significantly lower oil revenues. But in the previous four years, since the oil boom started, and I, I pegged that to the end of 2003, so from 2004 through 2008, while the rest of us here in America were, uh, were, were leveraging to the hilt and going on a spending binge, uh, Saudi Arabia was saving and reducing its debt. So the government of Saudi Arabia, these two uh, excellencies with us today, uh, accumulated foreign assets that grew from about $100 billion in 2004 to about $450 billion today. And the stimulative expansionary budget that the government has announced for 2009 includes about a $15 billion deficit. At the same time, the government has reduced its debt from a high in 1999 of, by our cal calculation, close to 120% of GDP down to, again, by our calculation at Jadwa today, to between 12 and 15% of GDP. So a $15 billion deficit for a stimulus uh, 
budget in Saudi Arabia is easily covered by the very large accumulation of foreign assets and the pay down of government debt over the past several years. So the government is poised very well to withstand what has been a substantial drop in oil prices, but at a rate of 50, at a price of $50 a barrel, it's a very comfortable position, and I would suggest that it's actually quite comfortable for the long term. Now, our view at uh, Jadway is that oil prices will uh, rebound to an area between 60 and $90 per barrel, but at $50 per barrel, uh, that's not too bad, and that actually in 1999, if we projected forward 10 years and said, in the midst of a global recession, oil will be formulating a bottom or a base in the peak of the recession at $50 a barrel. You know, we'd have all been saying, you know, our wildest dreams have come true. For oil producers, that's a very strong price. And Saudi Arabia is well positioned in that kind of price environment. So the slump in oil prices has not had a significant impact on government <coughs> finances and will not, and the government is poised to stimulate the economy and keep it growing. And that gets me to my second question, what are the prospects for our economic boom? Well, I think we move in 2009 to a period where the government has to be the prime driver of growth, and it is doing that with a government that, budget that is not only at an all-time high, but the increase in spending on a percentage basis is one of the largest in several years, and that's quite interesting at a time of downturn. So the government uh, says, I've heard uh, His Excellency the governor of Sama say several times that we run in Saudi Arabia counter cyclical policies and indeed when things were great the government saved uh, money and now as things have turned down a bit the government is spending more money to stimulate the economy and that's part of that counter cyclical policy. So the government will be an important driver of the growth in 2009 and we were certainly affected by the downturn globally. An important distinction to make for those of you that have just lived through this in the United States is that in emerging markets, this hit us very recently and very hard. In the United States, it started with a peak in housing in mid-2006, and things started to gradually deteriorate over the course of 2007, and then sharply deteriorated in September last year with the failure of Lehman Brothers. But in emerging markets, in Saudi Arabia, it all just hit us hard, starting with the failure of Lehman Brothers last year. To me, on that day, the recession in the United States became globalized, became instantly globalized, and it hit us quite hard. It hit us in our stock markets, and it hit the performance of the economy, and it was reflected in caution of consumers, businesses, in their spending and plans, and in the fourth quarter of last year, we felt that. But the answer to the question is the boom over. I don't think it's over, but I think it changes a bit. A year ago, we were in an economy that was becoming a bit overheated, and the issues of the day were inflation, which was sharply rising and in double digits, and upward pressure on the exchange rate. Today, those are not the issues of the day at all. They have largely dissipated. But we're not going into a prolonged period of low growth. If we come out of this downturn with oil prices between 50 and 70 or $80 a barrel, and with growth that by our, our forecast will be between 4 and 6% for the private sector, and with dropping or at least containable inflation, then that's a better and more sustainable growth picture that is still a boom, but not a boom that leads to bust, which is not what anyone wants. And I would just highlight for the audience here that does not spend much time in Saudi Arabia, that if you hear stories about Dubai, Saudi Arabia did not have a property bubble. That's unique to other parts in the region, but not Saudi Arabia. So we don't have that adjustment that we're working through. Much of the growth of the past few years was mega project oriented and all of that that is government driven or driven by Saudi Aramco continues with the exception of some uh, retendering that is going on to capture the declining construction costs in the world but that goes forward unabated. Where there is some issue is in mega projects that are purely private sector, petrochemicals for example, and the problems there relate to financing and that leads me to my third question what are our credit conditions like in Saudi Arabia now? And the first part of the message there is that the banks are fine. The banks are very solid, they're well capitalized, there aren't that many, so they were easy to regulate and keep the, well, I shouldn't say they're easy to regulate, but there are not so many that it's hard to regulate. Uh, and uh, they've been well regulated, and they didn't have much exposure to bad assets from the West. They have, over the past few months, like banks everywhere in the world, tightened their lending standards, looked a little bit more closely at the credit worthiness of their customers. But in Saudi Arabia, in the banking sector, we've not really had any securitization of loans on the balance sheets of banks. 
So what we did here in much of the rest of the world of uh, originate loans and then sell them off to somebody else quickly doesn't happen in Saudi Arabia. All the loans in Saudi Arabia are kept on the balance sheets of the banks that originate them so they know their customers well because they have to keep those loans. So while there's been some tightening of credit standards, that's now loosening a little bit and credit is easing and, uh, easing and it's being uh, fostered by the easing policies of the central bank. That's only one leg of the story of the credit market in Saudi Arabia. The very large projects historically have also depended on large syndicated loans with participation from regional and international <coughs> banks. And that market has largely dried up globally for the time being. The time being actually may last a long time. And there's an area where I think you have some creeping protectionism is not really the right word, but the big money center banks in London and New York that are receiving government assistance are, there's a, well, not unspoken, but a spoken mandate to increase their lending locally in countries where they're getting the assistance from and not increase more overseas. So to put it not too uh, elegantly, I suppose, it wouldn't be very popular for Citibank, who's receiving $45 billion in assistance from the U.S. government, to use that money to lend to a petrochemical project in Saudi Arabia. They need to do more lending in the United States with the government <clears throat> money that they're receiving. So the participation of international banks in loan syndications probably is much reduced for a prolonged period. And the government institutions in Saudi Arabia that lend, there are a couple of them, Saudi Industrial Development Fund, Public Investment Fund, these are stepping up to fill that gap somewhat, but I'm not sure they can entirely fill that void. And then two other important pieces of the credit markets are the debt capital markets, which are bond issuances. And in our part of the world, there's been a sharp growth in Islamic bonds called Sukuk over the past few years and the equity capital markets, which is new IPOs on the stock market, that had been growing very sharply in Saudi Arabia for the past few years. Those two markets are, like elsewhere in the world, uh, more abundant for the time being. But I think as markets improve, those come back fairly quickly. So to summarize that point, our credit conditions are tight, but it's not because our banks are troubled in any way. It's because international banks are not participating in the market like they used to, and the debt and equity capital markets are, for the time being, constrained. And then the fourth question is, uh, what's, speaking of markets, what's happened to our markets and our investors? Uh, well, last year, the stock market in Saudi Arabia, which, by the way, is a national pastime, uh, it lost 60 percent. And in 2006, the market lost 60 percent. So those are two p very painful declines. Uh, in 2006, the market was in the early euphoric stages of a boom and was by everyone's acknowledgement, richly priced. Price to earnings ratios were in the high 40s. So when it started to decline, it declined on high volume as everyone headed for the exits. They expected that to be a bubble that was bursting somewhat. It was different this time because the market in 2008 was trading at a PE ratio of around 13. The companies listed on the market had great earnings growth prospects. And the market was purely pulled down in strong correlation with global markets and especially Western markets, and that's still true today. So starting in September especially, the market took a sharp downturn and pulled a lot of uh, investors with it on low volume who weren't expecting it to go down. And to put it away, one of our clients put it last week, as I was trying to explain why this downturn was more painful than the downturn in 2006, he said, of course it was more painful. In 2006, I lost my profits. In 2008, I lost my capital. <laughs> and I think that uh, summarizes how many Saudi businessmen feel about the market downturn. So it has inflicted some pain. And by our calculation, about $150 billion worth of pain of lost uh, wealth, paper wealth of the private sector invested in the Saudi stock market. So that's hurt somewhat. And that's related to global markets, not Saudi markets. Well, the last question, which is Jane's question, is what does this look like on the other side of the abyss? When we come out and uh, there's no more recession, where's Saudi Arabia positioned and what does this mean for ties, economic ties with the U.S. and business <coughs> interests in particular? First, as Jane asked that question, I thought recovery from the recession will not be even. All countries in the world will not come out at the same time and at the same speed. And those countries who have financial sectors that are more stressed and have to rebuild capital and that are countries that are more leveraged and need to go through a longer deleveraging process, which is a drag on growth, those countries will recover more slowly. 
Saudi Arabia is not in that position, so I think Saudi Arabia is poised to recover very quickly. And in fact, the downturn in Saudi Arabia and the real economy has not been that sharp. And talking to our clients, I'm starting to get the feeling already that we've turned the corner in many respects. It's fairly sector specific, but the environment of December, January is quite different from the environment now, so I believe we've turned the corner. So I think Saudi Arabia comes back relatively quickly. Now, Saudi Arabia as a country is not very leveraged. Saudi Arabia as a country is fairly cash rich. Saudi Arabia as a country has already become the gravitational, the center of gravity of the economies of the Middle East. I think all of this just becomes greater as we come out of the recession. Saudi Arabia has not been as prominent as some of the other Gulf players in buying Western corporate assets, buying companies outside Saudi Arabia, but I think that probably accelerates. Assets are cheap, uh, there's cash and not much leverage in Saudi Arabia, so it's well poised to uh, pick up assets around the world at reasonable prices, and I think we'll see some of that. That makes Saudi Arabia more prominent in the news and just a more prominent player on the scene. Relatively, it has not struggled so much, and so it will not take so much time to repair the economy, and so we'll be focusing on growth and opportunities that emerge from the crisis rather than uh, repairing the damage. For Americans and American business out there, I participate in American business groups. We have a delegation <coughs> here with us this morning from that group in Riyadh. And I've been disappointed through the last eight years uh, to see that the Americans have been more emotion-based in their thinking about doing business in Saudi Arabia than fact-based. I'm pleased to see that dissipating. I don't think it ever goes away entirely, but we are more like that than are those that are closer to Saudi Arabia going out into Asia first, Europe second, the United States third. We're the most uh, emotion-based about it. I encourage American businesses to come out to Saudi Arabia, to kick the tires, to make your judgments based on the facts, you still may decide that's not the place to do business, but at least you will have decided it for the right reasons. Uh, but it's quite a different uh, place, and it will be different. And one broad trend I would cite in that respect is that the region, not just Saudi Arabia, but the GCC, is becoming quite interesting from a consumption perspective. That's a reason in the past that Americans would expand into Asia, right? 1.3 billion people in China, et cetera, et cetera. But Saudi Arabia and the GCC are quite interesting and compelling from a growth in consumption, a general improvement in the material well-being of the populations there, their general propensity to consume, meaning buying a lot of American products is high. And so I encourage you to take a fresh look at it from that standpoint, that it's not just a good market to be in to produce because of low-cost energy for another part of the world. It's a very interesting market to be in to produce and to for that market in its own right, and Saudi Arabia is the most interesting in that respect. So it's uh, co come on out and uh, take a look at the place uh, based on the facts, and I think that uh, over the next few years will be quite an exciting story. I share His Excellency the Finance Minister's optimism about the economy going forward. I think we have turned the corner. I think we'll be quite well positioned as uh, the world improves. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Governor, you have your 10 minutes. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I guess I can still say good morning to everybody, if I can see. Um, next time, I'm going to ask Brad to be at another city when I'm speaking, <laughs> because he has stolen some of the thunder from my talk. I thought counter-cyclicality was my baby, and you weren't <laughs> supposed to touch it. <laughs> but I will still read the statement, just as the minister said. We spent a lot of time working on it. And I'm not going to let anybody take that right from me. Uh, I think it's. The theme of, of this get-together is, uh, is critical to all of us. And I think the issue that was raised in the morning session about interdependence, uh, be it in energy or be it in, in other areas, is, is very critical. And for us to enhance and appreciate that interdependence, I think we need to understand each other better. And it was mentioned also. To understand each other better, 
will be helped if we explain ourselves and listen to each other better than has been the case. And I think uh, today I will try to, exp to, to use that uh, theme uh, to explain how we in the Central Bank, in the Saudi Arabian Monetary Agency, uh, do our business and therefore hopefully you will appreciate uh, what we do and how we do it. Uh, of course this is not a very uh, 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 sexy topic. I mean this is uh, the dismal science in economics. So you will have to bear with me. But I think if we were to understand why Saudi Arabia has avoided um, uh, the pitfalls of the uh, financial meltdown uh, and how we have protected our home front uh, in that sense, uh, it will be uh, quite an achievement if I can do that. And I think as friends who are interdependent and trying to deepen that interdependence, I think it will be important to appreciate that contribution. When you go into a crisis, good friends are friends who have protected their home front and they're not a burden on the community uh, of nations. And I think that type of contribution should not be uh, overlooked. I'm glad I wasn't asked to speak about sovereign wealth funds because I had a lot to say about that at the Davos two years ago. And therefore, Heidi mentioned it. it uh, I was tempted, but I, I'm, I'm going to avoid that. Um, so let me, at the outset, then also thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, speak uh, today. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, as I mentioned, I will uh, share my thoughts with you on the importance of counter-cyclical policies for macroeconomic stability. We are going through a period of unprecedented financial turmoil, historic erosion of wealth, and serious threats to financial stability. The worst combination is to have a recession and a financial crisis simultaneously. We have seen an aggressive fiscal stimulus and monetary policy response to the crisis, as well as the use of unorthodox monetary measures. Let us hope that these measures will prove to be effective in containing this crisis. Economies have always experienced business cycles. Each cycle is unique in its length, the depth of the trough, and the height of the peak. At the peak, there is euphoria, and people feel the cycle has been abolished. Alas, the present crisis was made worse by a long period of loose monetary policy, but its roots are also to be found in light touch regulation and the so-called self-regulation of financial institutions. But let's face it, self-regulation is no regulation. The result was that the banks indulged in unrestrained leverage, helped by the impact of accounting rules and the questionable practices of rating agencies. In my observation, there was a natural tendency to pro-cyclicality in the financial system. This has been especially true in the last few years with the asymmetries in the global economic order where the surplus economies supplied credit to the advanced deficit economies. During an economic boom or expansion, bankers are prone to excessive optimism and the supply of credit rises, fueling asset price inflation. Bank supervisors see robust earnings and low levels of problem loans. Governments see rising employment and tax revenues from the financial sector, and so there is a tendency towards regulatory arbitrage and regulators competing with each other to offer the lightest touch. In such euphoria, governments run budget deficits which are easily financed. Rising asset prices create a large wealth effect and stimulate consumer demand and wage growth. Inflation appears subdued and loose monetary policy further encourages growth. 
government safety nets in the form of deposit insurance or implied guarantees of financial institutions encourage risk taking and further leverage until the bubble bursts. In short, financial procyclicality accentuates and exacerbates the cyclical tendencies of economic activity. In an economic downturn, bankers' optimism turns into pessimism. Asset quality deteriorates and it becomes obvious that the banks have inadequate levels of reserves. Regulators get tougher as earnings collapse. This situation forces banks to go for higher provisions, resulting in a contraction in bank credit and an increase in risk premia charged to borrowers. Consumers are hit, are hit first by the fall in asset prices, especially housing, so they reduce spending. The fall in employment levels exacerbate the economic downturn and cause more unemployment, which reduces private sector spending even further. Governments increase their budget deficits, which tend to crowd out productive private sector borrowing and make their debt to GDP levels even higher. This is where we are. The current crisis in the center of the financial system globally is sucking in capital. This means that countries at the periphery are losing their access to the capital they need to help maintain growth and keep their financial system liquid. Since the mid-1980s, developing countries have experimented with various measures of stabilization in order to reduce unsustainable fiscal and current account deficits. The Asian financial crisis in the late 90s was a catalyst for the region to pursue second sound economic policies and to accumulate foreign exchange reserves as a cushion against adverse capital flows. This is necessitated by the fact that their currencies are not reserve currencies. Some of these reserves flowed back into the advanced economies and helped fuel an already forming bubble. We have a global financial system, but a set of national banking regulators, and the result is that global regulatory arrangements are inadequate to handle the systemic risk posed by international banks. Indeed, both our recent experience and the theoretical analysis indicate that counter-cyclicality in fiscal, monetary, and regulatory policies is necessary to mitigate the adverse effects of economic cycles on global growth. Saudi Arabia has a great deal of experience of managing a counter-cyclical fiscal policy, and the minister and Brad uh, elaborated a bit on that. The volatility of growth of an oil exporter is much higher than in the United States because of swings in the price of oil. We use fiscal policy to reduce the impact, of the impact on our domestic economy. When oil income is low, the government runs budget deficits to support domestic demand and investment, and the debt to GDP level rises as a result. At its peak in 1999, the government debt to GDP ratio was over 100%, as Brad also mentioned. This debt has been paid down over the last few years to a current level of below 15% as the government has run budget surpluses. Again, that's countercyclical. This means we have the flexibility to support demand, and this year the government is running a budget deficit. If the advanced economies had followed fiscal consolidation in good times by reducing their debt-to-GDP ratio on the last few years, they would have more room to maneuver in their response to the current, to the current crisis. Let me now say a few words about what should be the key attributes of a supervisory and regulatory framework for the banking sector. They include st strong regulatory capital requirements, robust standards for bank liquidity, enhanced risk management, and macro, super, macro prudential supervision of bank activities <coughs> and improved transparency. Countercyclicality as applied to banks' capital requirements would use the so-called so approach of dynamic provisioning. 
banks would have to build up a protective cushion in the form of loan loss provisions and capital in the upswing of the cycle so that they can be used in the downswing. This should be combined with a simple approach to liquidity and leverage ratios. In the current crisis, banks became too reliant on interbank funds. It is quite prudent to impose a mandatory liquidity ratio for banks in the form of highly liquid marketable assets and cash as a percentage of their deposits. Supervisors also need to combine the micro-prudential work on individual banks with a macro-prudential approach looking at risks to the financial system as a whole. And this will need close cooperation among regulators and financial institutions worldwide. In conclusion, pro-cyclicality when built into the financial system is undesirable because it exacerbates excesses. <clears throat> the best way to counter excessive pro-cyclicality is to eliminate the practices that contribute to it. These can be fiscal, monetary, and regulatory. Sound macroeconomic and financial policies as well as continued vigilance are the best way to prevent crises re recurring. Financial supervision failed spectacularly in a number of advanced countries, and we need greater effectiveness in making sure that banks manage their risks better in the future. Supervisors must move towards greater cooperation and more focus on overall financial stability, as well as looking at the soundness of individual banks. Financial stability is needed for growth, which in turn sustains macroeconomic stability. In short, a strong economy requires a sound financial system, which depends not only on markets, but also on prudent, though not intrusive, public intervention. The famous Wall Street investor Benjamin Graham once said, the people on Wall Street learn nothing and forget everything. We must learn the right lessons from this crisis and resist the temptation to go back to business as usual in the financial markets. Let's not commit the same mistake again. Thank you very much for your attention. The title of this panel, Economics as a National Security Imperative, and more particularly, what it would mean for the way in which the United States handles its partnership with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In the context of the current economic crisis, I think the United States is beginning to think about economics as a foreign policy national security issue. The fact that Senator Kerry would ask someone like, like Heidi to join his staff at the Foreign Relations Committee is certainly a sign of progress in that regard. But on the whole, I would argue that the United States has yet to come to grips with the strategic consequences for its own international position of two very profound economic developments. Um, one of those developments or sets of developments I'll label as structural shifts in international energy markets. And the second category of profound developments I'll label strategic trends in global finance. Um, not surprisingly, the US-Saudi relationship lies at the heart or the center of both of these developments. When I talk about structural shifts in particularly oil and gas markets, um, at the risk of oversimplification, I'll boil it down to a couple of things. One is, over the last decade, you've had emerging markets, rising powers, uh, what we used to call developing countries, um, establish themselves as really the main centers for incremental growth in demand for hydrocarbon-based energy looking forward. We are all going through an economic downturn, which has uh, had its effects on energy demand. But this is a structural shift. And as, as economic growth begins to pick up, 
we will see a return of this phenomenon of demand growth, particularly in what we used to call the developing world. That is not going to go away. And then the other structural shift that comes into play is a whole set of what are essentially above ground and largely political constraints on the growth of supply for oil and natural gas. Um, this is in some cases the result of decisions by national governments um, of, of producer countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a very clear exception to that. But it's also, frankly, the result of US policy. From an energy security standpoint, what do you make of a US policy toward Iraq that before, both before Saddam was overthrown and since has basically ensured that Iraq has been and is likely to remain um, in a state of profound underperformance as um, an oil producer. You know, anyone who argues that the Iraq war was, an oil, uh, was a war for oil, man, if that's the case, it was an even more incompetently planned and executed <laughs> operation than even I think it was. <laughs> and not content with that contribution to global energy security, the United States, across Democratic and Republican administrations, has compounded that with a policy toward Iran, which says, in essence, that the world's second largest proven reserves of conventional crude oil and the world's second largest proven reserves of natural gas should stay in the ground until we in Washington decide, for reasons that will have nothing to do with the global energy balance, that it's OK to monetize those reserves. Okay, that's what I mean by above ground constraints. And you put the two developments on the demand side and on the supply side together, and what you saw from late in 99 until the middle of 2008 was a very steady trend toward higher and higher prices for hydrocarbon based energy that produced, I think, the biggest transfer of wealth from one group of countries to another in human history, and mark my words, within the next few years, as economic recovery kicks in, demand starts to grow, once again, we will be back on the path toward higher prices, and that transfer of wealth will only continue. The second development that I've talked about is strategic trends in global finance. And here you have a situation where you have a financial system that is characterized by really unprecedented economic imbalances. And you have a monetary system characterized by a longstanding reliance on the dollar as the preferred reserve and transactional currency in the world. But given everything else that is going in the on in, in the world, it seems like dollar hegemony is an increasingly shaky proposition. Now, those developments have huge implications for America's international position. They should have huge implications for American foreign policy. And in particular, they should have huge implications for the way that America deals with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. At the G20 summit in London, there was a lot of talk about the so-called G2, this emerging partnership relationship um, <laughs> between the United States and China. I think the G2 model was originally coined by, by Fred Bergson. But on the margins of the G20 summit, you heard a lot of talk about the G2. I don't want to minimize, certainly, the importance of China and the importance of the US relationship with China. 
I would argue, though, that in terms of dealing with the economic challenges to America's strategic position in energy and in finance, our relationship with Saudi Arabia is at least as important to our international standing looking forward as our relationship with China. And there certainly, I don't want to say that we shouldn't be thinking about a G2, but I would think it's even better if we could think about a G3 and recognize the central role that Saudi Arabia is going to play on energy and on finance in coming years. What would it mean for American foreign policy if we really took Saudi Arabia seriously as a partner in these areas? Well, I'll try and offer a few comments about that with regard to both energy and finance. On the energy scene, um, as I said, we have a lot of above ground constraints on the growth of supply. One of the few bright spots in that picture is the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Aramco, several years ago, committed itself to expanding its installed productive capacity for crude oil to uh, 12 and a half million barrels a day. They are on track to reach that target by next year. Um, I don't doubt, I don't know anybody in the oil industry who doubts that Aramco will meet that goal. They are meeting it at a price tag of something that will probably come in at between 60, 70 billion dollars. Now, that may not seem like a lot to you, um, but you know, given all of the pent up infrastructure demand in Saudi Arabia, all of the needs for capital in the kingdom to promote the kinds of economic modernization, innovation that our Saudi speakers have spoken about, you know, there are other things that Saudi Arabia could have done with that capital other than expand uh, Aramco's productive capacity, but in no small part because the United States exhorted them to do this, Saudi Aramco and the Kingdom made this commitment, and as I said, they are um, on the verge of fulfilling that commitment. But what is their reward for that? Uh, what is their reward for that from the new Obama administration. Well, uh, part of their reward for that was to be greeted with a posting on the White House website, um, which talked about the Obama administration's uh, firm commitment to ending America's addiction to foreign oil, and as a first step to that, during President Obama's first term, to eliminating oil imports from Venezuela and the Middle East. Okay? I don't know really where to begin in, in kind of unpacking the economic ridiculousness of that proposition. So I won't even really get into that. As a political proposition, um, I think that is just absurd. Um, it's worse than absurd. It is really dangerous over the long run for American interests. If we think that Saudi Arabia will simply continue whenever we want to install more productive capacity and will, whenever we want, produce more oil just because we want it. I think to treat that proposition 
as an assumption and not as something which has to be cultivated, nurtured, discussed in the context of a genuine strategic partnership, um, I think that's a really dangerous way for the United States to approach this relationship. Um, but we really have yet to wake up to the new realities of America's international position and what that means for the way that we conduct our business with Saudi Arabia. On finance, as I said, I think that dollar hegemony, the way that the United States has <coughs> thought of it, promoted it, defended it for decades, is simply not sustainable over the long run. And we're to have a fundamental choice to make. We can either be in denial about that reality, we can try to hold on for as long as we can to the traditional version of dollar hegemony and then wait to see how bad it is when dollar hegemony finally implodes. Or we can actually be proactive about talking to our major creditor partners, which includes China, but also certainly includes Saudi Arabia. We can begin to discuss with them in an authoritative way how the composition of international reserve assets needs to and should shift over the long term to create a more sustainable monetary basis for economic growth and prosperity in decades to come. That would be real leadership. That would be leadership on the scale of what Senator Hagel evoked earlier this morning when he spoke about those Marshall, Truman, Atchison who were present at the creation in the aftermath of World War II. If there is going to be a new creation, a new and viable international economic order for the 21st century, um, I'm enough of a chauvinist to think that American leadership is going to be required to do that, but it is going to have to be American leadership that is exercised in close partnership with countries that have indispensable resources, assets, and wisdom to bring to bear on these problems. And there is no country in the world that fits that bill more than the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And it is time that the United States began to have a realistic discussion, first of all, in its own councils about America's international position. And then, as I said, begin to have a more realistic discussion with our most important partners um, for how to deal with this situation and move to a more sustainable future. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm injecting myself here because I know Jane Sassine's job is to try to provoke uh, our Minister uh, uh, of Finance, our Governor, and all of you uh, as best she can to sort of provoke uh, the stock markets and, and, and to create reactions which will be waiting. The reason I'm here is to tell you one of the things that New America Foundation excels at is not taking breaks. Um, we're going to, you know, have some brief breaks, but uh, I'm going to, uh, I believe in stakeholder approaches to problem solving, but to con continue to have a rich discussion, which we will, I need to ask all of you to be a stakeholder in the problem solving we're about to have. And that is, I've asked the Four Seasons Hotel to begin bringing you lunch now. That means we need to maintain quiet, attentiveness, and to kind of move in your chairs, those with their legs, you know, sprawled way out, if you might pull them in, uh, if you might make sure that your uh, uh, papers and whatnot allow a page to be put into you, we'll continue to move into the next session. So, Jane Sassine, 
uh, the Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief of Business Week. And can we do this without talking? Thank you. This session is not over. I appreciate it. Okay, great. Thank you all. And yes, uh, we'll just we'll, we'll go right over the uh, silverware shaking. I wanted to start with uh, kind of touch on some of the, the, the issues that Flint just raised and the, the question of, can you all, can you all hear? The question of interdependence that, that the governor raised. The Chinese, as several of you mentioned, have talked about the, their feeling that the, the world is too dependent, uh, and they, in particular because their position in treasuries is too dependent on the dollar. Uh, that's potentially an issue for you all as well. I wanted to get your reaction to the Chinese uh, suggestion of the need for a, 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 another a broader global reserve currency. Is that something you see as a problem for Saudi Arabia? Is it something you would support? Oh, sorry, no, Governor. No, that's, I'm sorry. That's, <laughs> talking to me or to him? <laughs> to you, Governor, if you could answer, the, if you could address that, please. Myself? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Because I thought you were talking to uh, Sorry. Steve. Steve just told me it's you I've got to provoke. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the issue of a global reserve currency mm -hmm. is not a mechanical uh, problem that you just decide, okay, let's have a global reserve currency. This is something that has gained over a long period of time of developing markets with a lot of products, a lot of depth, a lot of liquidity, mm -hmm. a lot of safety for people to want to hold those assets. And therefore, you all remember before the launch of the euro, uh, somebody mentioned Fred Bergsten. Uh, he, uh, I remember a conference, I think it was in 1997 at the IMF, and he projected that there would be a major shift uh, from dollar reserves to uh, the euro once it's launched. That did not happen. The dollar still commands about 60% of global reserves. And the reason, it's because of the depth and the liquidity of the dollar market. And the dollar, not just the simple currency, it's really all the plethora of financial assets that people can hold in, in different maturities and different uh, forms. So I think Raising the issue that we need a global reserve currency, I mean, the, the euro is there, the sterling is there, the Swiss franc is there. All of these currencies are there and trying their best to be the mm -hmm. ultimate uh, global reserve currency. But the dollar still commands that position. And until and unless very serious major dislocations or policy failures in protecting the, the dollar status as the uh, global reserve currency of the world, uh, then I don't see any, any, any changes. And those of us who are in the market, we are looking for liquidity, safety, and return. So as long as the dollar or whatever currency provides that, we're going to be using it. Given the risks ahead, given the, the U.S. deficit, the incredible amount of spending, the concerns that uh, you know, with all the, the monetary and fiscal policy going into the economy that we could end up in a very inflationary period and, and a rise in interest rates and a, a drop in the, the dollar over the course of the next few years. What are the risks to Saudi Arabia, though, that, uh, of that kind of a crash in the dollar? How do, you, how, do you, how do you protect yourself against that, given the enormous stakes you have in the dollar? There are a lot of uh, policies that are available to any reserve manager that they, they can uh, uh, use to mitigate these types of risks. But let's remember also that foreign exchange risk, which is the case we're talking about here, is predicated on the relative values of currencies. I mean, there is no absolute rate for the dollar. There is a relative rate for the dollar vis-a-vis -vis the euro or the Swiss franc or what have you. And therefore, if the other economies are not doing much better uh, than the U.S. economy, if they are lagging in the business cycle, let's say, because mm -hmm. Europe, for example, now a lot of people are saying that Europe is probably behind the U.S. in getting into, into recession, but it will take them a longer period also to get out of it. So in relative terms, it's not as clear-cut a case that the dollar alone is in trouble and therefore people should be looking for the lifeboats out of the dollar. That is not uh, the case yet. Okay. 
Uh, and Minister, could you address, there was obviously a lot of discussion this weekend about the, the possibility of the BRIC countries uh, increasing the funding of the IMF through a bond offering that would be separate from the, the, the standard, more long-term procedure. Um, several questions. One, is that something, an idea that you think is potentially useful, uh, constructive? Uh, and could you also then a little more broadly at, address the question of uh, the Saudi position in terms of there's been a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, discussion, as it were, uh, that the Saudis should uh, increase some, support some of the increased funding for the IMF, and so far that has not happened. Uh, can you explain yes. why that is? If you see any change in that position coming, would this be a, a, a route in which you might consider increasing funding towards the, providing more funding towards the IMF? Well, and, uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, there has been a lot of discussions about uh, providing uh, funding uh, for the IMF, precautionary maybe, more than real, uh, because the, the, the fund needs, mm -hmm. or, and the markets need to see that, that, that the resources are there if needed. And uh, there was an agreement to, to, to provide uh, uh, about $500 billion mm -hmm. to the, what is called the, the NAB, that's the new arrangement to borrow as part of the, the, the um, uh, instruments that the, the IMF uh, has. Saudi Arabia is uh, actually a member of that arrangement, the current one. It's, it's about $50 billion. Uh, dollars. Now the, the, the uh, decision is to, to uh, multiply it by 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, there has been a number of countries that uh, announced their, their intention to contribute to that. One of them is the European Union, about $100 billion. The Japanese, $100 billion. The uh, U.S. Uh, is proposing also to, to raise $100 billion. So, and other countries. So that we, we are getting closer to that, uh, that uh, target. Um, and uh, for us, uh, there are other means to, 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 to help the, the, uh, the IMF, whether it's through this specific instrument or through bonds or, or, or uh, different, different means. And I'm sure that the, 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 the IMF treasurer will... Are you involved in the negotiations with the BRIC countries? Well, to, as, to, as to members... To purchase the bonds, and, and would you... Would you purchase some of those bonds? Well, I'm still, we are, we are looking at uh, different options as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned. Mm -hmm. I know that there are a number of countries that they uh, found the uh, bonds are more attractive than being part of this uh, uh, NAP or the new mm -hmm. arrangement to, to borrow. But as far as we are concerned, and a number of countries as well, uh, we are still looking at our options. Um, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, has been a very active supporter of the IMF. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the early 80s, we uh, single-handedly carried the, the, the programs of the IMF to help Latin American countries. We provided the, the fund for, uh, with, with uh, about 11 uh, billion uh, SDRs uh, to, to help the, what is, was called then enlarged access of the, the uh, yes. countries. To the resources, and before that, we have provided the oil facility, the, the uh, supplementary facilities, and others. So, uh, uh, w again, we'll look at the different options that that uh, are uh, now available, and and we'll make decision accordingly. We should be, perhaps, by by the fall meeting, looking at the, the total package and the, the financing needs of the of the uh, IMF. Okay. Heidi, could you address from you know, the minister's comments notwithstanding, and obviously the efforts you all have made uh, to stimulate uh, your own economy in, in the region, there is a perception that, uh, that the, the Saudi Arabia is not stepping up enough to address some of the, the broader funding issues of the IMF, and certainly a sense that there's been a lot of behind-the-scenes pressure. Could you address the question, do you, do you think that there has been enough, uh, are they doing enough, I guess, really, to, to help uh, address the, the financial issues in the global crisis? Well, I'm, I'm not personally involved in, in the negotiations, um, but it's my understanding um, that first the, the negotiations are ongoing, nothing has been concluded yet, so the discussions are, are still underway. Um, and second, in terms of, in particular, the, the, um, the stimulus to the economy, which, um, which was very much lauded by the, the IMF at these past meetings um, as being one of a handful of countries that has actually pursued um, the, the IMF uh, mm -hmm. target of, of 2%. Um, so I, I think that I, I, there's, there's no 
there's no question in my mind that, that Saudi Arabia is, is doing doing what it what it's committing to. And as the um, the discussions evolve, I'm hopeful that they'll uh, th that will also lead to um, to contribution to the funding mechanisms through whichever way that Saudi Arabia feels comfortable doing so. Amir, can I add yeah. just one Please. word? Um, of course, all the the emphasis in all these discussions is that each country has to do its part domestically to mm -hmm. stimulate its own economy yeah. and adopt the appropriate uh, monetary policies, uh, policies as well. And in that, I mentioned in my statement, we are the highest among the, the G20 as far as the stimulus packages are concerned. So we are doing well, the, the investment program of 400 billion that, that King Abdullah announced last November is, uh, is directly helping our economy, but it will be reflected on, on, on the rest of the world because most of the, those, the, that expenditure will be on, on goods and services imported from, from, uh, uh, from other, other countries. The other thing, and, and uh, the, the governor is here, is, is the easing of monetary policy in, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, of course, that uh, again, we have done uh, even more than our share of that. Oh, okay. Okay. Could, Flint, to go back a little bit to one of the things you had talked about, I mean, if this bond offering does come through as, it, as people assume it will, it seems to be, to some degree, a first step towards what the Chinese are talking about. Uh, is, is that, does, does this take us down the road to the development of that sort of a, a reserve currency that would ease some of these pressures or create that alternative that, that the governor was just discussing? Well, to some extent, I think the answer to that question depends on things that we may not know mm -hmm. right now. I mean, is this going to be um, a, a, a relatively short-term issue that is only made available to central banks and the central banks hold it for you know, a relatively short period of time and then it's done? Or does this really mark the move towards the creation of genuinely tradable instruments that are denominated in, in STRs. Does one of the central banks that, that holds it, you know, at some point basically create a secondary market for, for these instruments? We, at this point, we simply don't, don't know the answer to that question. Um, beyond what actually happens with this, with this bond issue, how it's structured, how it's implemented, um, you know, I think it is an important indicator of where at least some important players in the international economy want to go. Um, I mean, this is an outgrowth of a Chinese idea which attracted first Russian support and then seemingly uh, basically support from all of, the, all of the BRICS. I mean, really, you know, any country that has substantial dollar holdings, I would think, you know, has to be, you know, looking at the future and looking at, you know, and, and all of the things that the governor said about, you know, why no really clear alternative to the dollar has emerged at this point. All of those things are certainly true, but still looking long term, you know, the system the way it's constituted now can't go on mm -hmm. indefinitely. There's going to have to be some kind of greater multilateralization of responsibility for reserves. And even if that means nothing more than the U.S. is going to have to strike deals with creditors in which it actually makes commitments that it keeps regarding mm -hmm. fiscal policy, monetary policy, things like that, or if you're talking about the creation of new reserve um, assets on a multilateral basis, um, that's got to be the long-term trend, I think. Governor, your reaction to that? Would you think you know the issues and the, the time frame that uh, that you raised, notwithstanding, ultimately would it be better off? Would it be better, more in the interest of Saudi Arabia to have a, a broader base of, of of currency or a reserve currency, less than the dependence on the U.S. dollar? I, I think it's it's not just a question of a wish. I mean, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. I mean there are realities. I yeah. mean, we are economists. We are business people. We are investors. And we look at the landscape and we invest and take risks or make hedges on what is existing in the market. And the reality of the market is as, as we see. But also I want to add, I mean, this is not to say that long term nobody should be, everybody yeah. is analyzing what's going to happen down the road. 
we wouldn't be worth our salaries, as little as they may be, <laughs> uh, if we didn't think along those lines. But also, the U.S., if you notice, for example, the communique of the IMFC of the IMF, mm -hmm. it was clearly stated also, to answer such concerns, that the exit strategy from all of this huge fiscal stimulus and monetary easing that is taking place now is that the exit strategy is already being put in place, that once the recovery starts taking place, that the U.S. and the other major countries, especially those that are going very uh, extensively into stimulus, mm -hmm. how to mop up the liquidity, how yeah. to stabilize the situation, and maintain the value of the assets as denominated in the, in, in the dollar or uh, in the sterling or what have you. Yeah. Okay. Let me open it up. We have a few more minutes. Uh, if uh, anybody out there would like to ask a question, let me open it up. Any questions? The lunch is too delicious, apparently. There's a question. Yes, back there, please. Ian Tiley, Dow Jones Newswires. Uh, one thing that has been notably absent, but uh, I guess implicit in what uh, Mr. Levert was talking about, is uh, climate change uh, policy. Uh, right now, there's the meeting of major economies forum, the State Department discussions going on uh, between Chinese and the U.S. Uh, if the U.S. implements a, uh, a tough target in terms of emission reductions, uh, how does this change the nature of the relationship between U.S. and Saudi and Saudi and China uh, with uh, the growth that uh, Mr. Lever was talking about? Brad, do you want to take a shot at that first? Or did you want to? Yeah, I think that we haven't reached a point where there's been a clash between what is developing U.S. energy policy and uh, Saudi energy policy, uh, policy. But there's a very strong climate change component to the Obama administration policy. Flint mentioned the early wording of wanting to eliminate imports from the Middle East and Venezuela. That's been changed now to say we want to reduce our consumption by 4.2, I believe, million barrels per day over 10 years, which is the equivalent of what the U.S. imports from Venezuela and the Middle East. And it may actually be achievable. And it's not really a bad idea. It's just a question of how you word it. Uh, but one thing Saudi Arabia needs and asks for frequently is security of demand. Just like the consuming world needs security of supply. And our minds are focused on the many supply disruptions of the past few decades. Saudi Arabia is concerned about security of demand. You're saying specifically you don't want our oil, but more broadly you're saying you don't want oil and specific policies to reduce uh, consumption of oil. So I think there's some uh, uh, good head-to-head -head discussions to be had as the administration unfolds and, and pursues this policy aggressively on climate change, especially in pursuing, and this is a personal view I have, uh, alternative technologies that just aren't economically viable. I have a thing about ethanol that is just to me, you know, as a taxpayer in the U.S., it's just not economically viable on its own, but we put so much into it. So over-promising on alternatives that can't deliver in a given economic environment, pushing a climate change in a way that is too, let's say, one-dimensional. I think where we end up on this, I, and, and China has to come into this fold too, and you see uh, what I view as more thoughtful rhetoric, rhetoric on this evolving in this direction is looking at the whole energy mix in which hydrocarbons will continue to play a very important role for the long term, in fact, the dominant role, but other viable alternatives that are important for the climate need to come into play. Uh, that will evolve over time, but I think there's quite a sharp distinction between what is the current rhetoric about climate change policy and what is really the perspective of the world's major oil producer on this. Okay. Yeah, I want to, just yeah. want to add that um, I don't think that, that a strong policy uh, uh, with regard to, to the emissions or, or carbon dioxide uh, uh, would be not only politically but also practically uh, feasible. Uh, so, so that I, I doubt that it would, uh, would happen. I, I mentioned in my statement the, the, that we need to work together to, to uh, uh, provide uh, efficient and clean fossil fuel uh, co consumption. And there is a huge potential for, for cooperation in, in that area. Because as we, as we all agree, the fossil fuels and, and the, will be there for a long time, uh, even with the uh, in, uh, growth in, in other alternative uh, 
uh, sources of, uh, of uh, energy. And uh, let, let me say also that we have recently established a center for, for uh, research on en energy and environment. It's going to be uh, a, a big center. We have already a big <coughs> endowment uh, for, for that center. It will be in, in, in uh, Riyadh. The king himself is personally uh, very much interested in, 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 this, uh, in this area. So we are also concerned about the, the having the, 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 the clean uh, sources of, of um, energy, particularly uh, based on, on uh, hydrocarbon. Uh, so so uh, I think we should be focusing more on, 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 uh, on, on that, uh, uh, that area. But uh, as far as the, the other sources, I'm not sure if that, that will be in the foreseeable uh, future. One, one thing that we have been facing in, in those institutions, the IMF mm -hmm. and the World Bank, and we have been uh, talking about it for quite some time. Our colleagues from, from uh, consuming countries pushing, saying, invest more, invest yeah. more, put uh, uh, more money. And I, th I think Flint mentioned that at that point. Yeah. Yet at the same time, calling for reducing consumption of oil. And this is something that uh, they, they, they cannot go together, you know. Uh, you want, they want us to put billions of dollars, and actually much more than what the, uh, uh, to invest in new production uh, exactly and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and increasing the capacity at the same time uh, uh, calling for increasing taxes and and uh, mm -hmm. and measures to reduce the the consumption of oil well, how concerned are you about the the rising level of rhetoric I mean there is almost a, a demonization of foreign oil in this country now is and, and particularly coming out of this the new administration and, and some of the types of things that Flint mentioned. What is the reaction within Saudi Arabia to hearing that kind of talk from the president of one of your closest allies? Well, I tell you, uh, w w uh, again, you know, we have been working to, with the U.S. in the mm -hmm. past as far as international institutions on, on, on issues related to, to, uh, uh, to the greening of, uh, of uh, growth. Our, our concern is that, uh, that it could affect the growth, especially in developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, uh, impact of putting uh, putting uh, pressures of those developing countries to to uh, give pri more priority to other policies rather than reducing poverty, mm -hmm. but also in in in, 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 uh, in advanced economies uh, as well because we have also our public opinion mm -hmm. and when when people uh, uh, read and listen to to consuming countries saying reduce your uh, your, your oil consumption. Uh, and at the same time, asking us for, for more investment, it, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to, uh, to defend. OK, great. Any one last question, perhaps? Yeah. Could you, could you speak into the microphone? Yes. Thank you. How do you characterize Saudi Arabia's um, dealings with other financial centers in the Gulf, like Bahrain? Qatar, Kuwait, which made profits recently, and Dubai. How do you link this also with the U.S. attitude to the area? Well, maybe Brad or, or Brad? Yes. Let, me, let me make yes. some initial observations yeah. on that. <coughs> Dubai, Qatar, Bahrain have fashioned themselves as financial centers, right? And, and they're all slightly different. Uh, Dubai is a, the DIFC, a little separate regulatory enclave Qatar says the whole country will have the same very friendly regulatory environment, uh, et cetera. And Bahrain actually was the first GCC financial center when Beirut declined with its civil war and, and it grabbed that opportunity. But the de facto case is that most of the business is in Saudi Arabia. So if you look at a list of the top 10 banks in the GCC, for example, five to seven of those banks will be Saudi banks that are headquartered in Saudi Arabia. So just the weight of the Saudi economy makes Saudi Arabia a very dominant, real financial center. What the others are doing are great in advancing the market and the depth of the products and services uh, offered. And there's probably room for all of them. And the market will decide which has which comparative advantage over the others. But I, I wouldn't look at them as competing to be the financial district or the financial center of the Gulf. What you hear about in Saudi Arabia and Riyadh is there is a real estate development that is the financial district of Riyadh, which will be very attractive, like a Wall Street where the banks and government offices that relate to markets 
uh, will be headquartered. And if you visited many of the bank head offices in Riyadh, some of them are very old and they need new head offices. Uh, so that financial district will succeed and will grow. Uh, but, I, but I think there's room for everybody. They're all quite different. But just keep in mind, Saudi Arabia is the big player. Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll okay. just add one point, which I mentioned in, uh, in passing in my statement. Uh, I agree with Brad. I mean, there is enough business really yeah. in the region, and each one uh, uh, have developed a certain model. I think the important thing is that with this financial crisis that we are going through now, it has sent a message also that light touch or no regulation is not the answer. Mm -hmm. So this regulatory arbitraging that at times is practiced in certain, in, in certain areas is no longer acceptable to the investors uh, in, in these institutions. And therefore, probably there will be an improvement in regulatory uh, oversight in all of these markets. And therefore, they probably will be even in a better position to serve the real economic needs, mm -hmm. not the speculative economic needs of uh, a, a, a very dynamic region we live in these days. How confident are you that, that given sort of where the, the discussions are within the G20, that that will, that a, a much more effective regulatory, international regulatory system uh, will be created. There's, there's obviously an enormous amount of discussion, and every time I do an interview with somebody, they talk about just the enormous complexity and how hard it will be, and what we often see after you know, one crisis is there's a solution to that crisis, and then 10 years later, the financial system finds a way to create another crisis that you, know, you, you couldn't prepare for. How are, are you, you know, it really is this question of the, the confidence, and given the difficulties involved and the challenges, in eliminating some of the arbitrage opportunities I'm, and whatnot. I'm much more optimistic yeah. because uh, the rhetoric has changed significantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were, I remember when we were negotiating the accession of Saudi Arabia to WTO, I mean, we were accused of creating barriers just because we emphasized adequate mm -hmm. capitalization of our financial institutions, including insurance. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't hear that. Now everybody is saying, Boy, you really knew what you were doing. Mm -hmm. So I think there was. Do you have any advice for Tim Geithner? <laughs> <laughs> He's a very good friend. We worked together since 1988 when I joined the IMF. Mm -hmm. So we, we compare notes a lot. And uh, Mr. Al Assaf also preceded me and preceded him there. So we have, we have very good working relationships. But I think now there is very clear acknowledgement from those countries that thought that self regulation was an option mm -hmm. that this is no longer. In a market economy, you really need good regulations. Mm -hmm. It's like the traffic system. You have beautiful highways, powerful cars, but if you don't have a good traffic system with alert cops, you know that mayhem is going to happen and nobody's gonna get to work. The financial system is very similar to that. Mm -hmm. And now there is clear acknowledgement from the, G, uh, the G20. Look at, for example, just one final example, the Financial Stability Forum mm -hmm. that has become now the Financial Stability Board. It has been enhanced in terms of membership. Saudi Arabia is a member now mm -hmm. in the Financial Stability Board. And there is a lot of work that is already going on between the Financial Stability Board and the IMF on early warning systems in developing uh, regulation for systemically important uh, uh, financial institutions, the colleges and all of that have already been established. So I think there is a clear appreciation that a market economy needs a good, robust mm -hmm. regulatory system and that there is no contradiction. The contradiction in the past was because control or decontrol was confused with deregulation. So it's like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Well, we don't, we don't need control in a market economy but we definitely need good regulation. Okay, let me ask you all a little bit. Apparently we have a couple more minutes than we thought. Uh, you all touched like, no we don't. We're cutting it off. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay, well let me thank all the panelists. This has been very interesting. Appreciate your time. Thank you.